So first and foremost, uh, history is by far uh, the most important uh, thing uh, when it comes to uh, evaluating anybody with when in the emergency room or with chest pain. 90% of your diagnosis is going to come from history alone. The patients really, really tell you what they have. Um, what they taught us in medical school about getting a real good history is actually true. Uh, try to get a real good uh, history because that will give you the answer in most cases. Um, the other thing I like to do is get a good exercise history. Find out about their exertion. If they just ran a marathon last week, they don't have significant coronary artery disease. Uh, now that doesn't mean a plaque didn't rupture, but if they come in telling you I have exertional uh, dyspnea or, or something, then, then obviously you got to look at something else. But get a real good exercise history. Uh, one website that I always point all my residents and students to is historyandphysical.net. This is a phenomenal website. Um, basically, this teaches you how to do a proper HMP, how to do a proper consult. Unfortunately, medical students and residents a lot of times are graded really on um, how well they do HMPs and how well they do consults, not really on their plan or assessment or the medical knowledge. But if you can put together a real good HMP or a real good consult, um, then all of a sudden your grade goes way up. So try to get really, really uh, good at this. Um, the website is phenomenally helpful. It has lots of little calculators on there as well, but get real good at a history and physical. Um, the next most important thing um, that we want to talk about is evaluating chest pain. Um, the most important thing I ask a patient when I first see them is if they say the words chest pain is what were you doing at the time? And we'll get into that a little bit later. So the three P's of chest pain, the patients can describe their chest pain in any of these three ways, positional, producible, or pleuritic. If it's positional, it's pericarditis. If they lay backwards or arch their back or take a deep breath or any kind of motion that causes them to arch their back, um, then, then that gives them um, that positional chest pain. Um, usually it's pericarditis. The only way they get any relief is by leaning forward um, uh, and leaning down, you know, kind of bringing their chest to their legs. Next thing you want to know, is it producible? Uh, and producible could mean anything, not just along the costochondral joints or, or whatever. If they turn their neck a certain way and they feel a shooting uh, pain down their left arm and tingling, that's some kind of cervical stenosis. If they're using a mouse on a desk or sitting a certain way at work, um, then that's what's causing it. But if they can produce their chest pain in any way, uh, then we know that that obviously uh, is not cardiac. It's and, and you can give NSAIDs or whatever it is. Sometimes they just tell you, you know, I felt like I tore something. I was lifting weights and I'm really, really sore. Um, that's happened before. We've gotten consulted on a young 20-year-old 20 male who uh, was lifting weights and, and thought he tore something and now he's real sore the next day. And, and guess what? His CK was elevated because he was lifting weights. So be smart doctors. Uh, the next kind of chest pain is pleuritic. The word pleuritic means changes with deep inspiration or becomes worse with deep inspiration. Um, and all that all that means is it's coming from the lungs somewhere, the pleural uh, space. It could be a pneumonia, it could be a pneumothorax, pleurisy, pleuritis for people who have those inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid or lupus. Uh, pericarditis even gives you positional chest pain because when you do take a deep breath like that, you arch your back, you, you, you arch your back, and that's what causes positional chest pain. Pulmonary embolus can give it to you, pleural fusion, and then I even spelled the word fractures. If you have rib fractures, I had to spell it this way to go along with the P's, but even rib fractures can give you uh, chest pain. Now you'll notice they all start with P, and almost all of these things uh, can give you a, a low-grade fever. Somebody comes in with a temperature 99 or 100, it could be any of those things, sure, if it's like 103 or 102 or a real good uh, fever with an elevated white count and all that, then you probably want to think infectious like a pneumonia or empyema or something. Um, but if not, um, then you can consider all these things. Um, and the other thing that, that you want to consider is an acute MI. Even an acute MI uh, can give you a low-grade fever. So the question really comes down to how good is history? When you're taking a history, you know, how, how, what can the patient say to tell me that they're having a heart attack? So there was a study done uh, by Swap and Nagurney in 2005. It was retrospective. Basically, they looked at all patients that came in that actually really had uh, acute coronary syndrome or really had coronary artery disease. Um, and then what kind of words did they say? And, and how likely are those words to predict whether or not they really have a heart condition? So at the top of the list was radiates to one arm or shoulder. Um, if they come in saying they have chest pain and it radiates to an arm or a shoulder or radiates to both arms or shoulders, 4.1 and 4.7 times more likely to be 
uh, cardiac than not. If it's associated with exertion, huge, two and a half times almost. Um, radiation to the left arm by itself helps. Associated with diaphoresis is a 2.0, um, still okay. Um, and then associated with nausea, vomiting, or worse or similar to, to other previous MIs or angina, not very highly uh, related. And then described as just a pressure sensation, um, doesn't correlate very well at all. So, you know, they, they always taught us in medical school, oh, they say, I feel like an elephant is sitting on my chest. Well, that squeezing pressure kind of sensation doesn't correlate very well. But if it's with exertion, radius to their arms, shoulders, both arms, both shoulders, neck, jaw, all those kind of things, and it goes away when they rest, then that is huge. They also took a look at how bad is history. Um, if the signs, um, um, if they if they describe their chest pain in one of these ways, um, then we know it's it's unlikely to be cardiac in nature. So pleuritic, positional, all those things we talked about before, pleuritic, uh, positional. Um, if it's described as sharp and tearing, if it's well circumscribed, if it's like a one centimeter, I mean a two centimeter by two centimeter area right under their left nipple. Um, then that's not likely to be a heart attack. Um, if it's reproducible with palpation, if you can touch their chest or, or, or muscle or anywhere on their chest wall and make it happen, then it's not their heart. If it's inframammary, anything below the nipple line, highly unlikely to be a heart attack. Um, if it's not associated with location at all, um, then, then that gets a little better. Uh, but usually people are having a heart attack, they describe this dull achy pain it's kind of all over their chest they really can't put a finger on it you know no sitting a certain way or moving a certain way or breathing a certain way doesn't make it better it's just kind of there the only thing that makes it uh, better or worse is uh, what we'll see on the next slide here so all these things that we talked about above are atypical angina. Um, typical angina is a very specific uh, definition. It's chest pain that's brought on by exertional or emotional stress. Uh, and it's relieved with rest or nitro. That's why when you're talking to patients, you, you ask them when you had the chest pain, what were you doing at the time? Well, I was just sitting around watching TV. Was there was it like a scary movie or was there something going on with the TV or just a regular old you know, show that you normally watch? You want to know if there's any emotion involved. A lot of times people have a huge, big family argument, um, and that's what triggers it. Um, so it's very, very important uh, to try to ascertain from the patient what's going on. Um, if you have both of these conditions, it's called typical angina. If they only have one of these, these two things, then it's called atypical angina. If they don't have either of these conditions, they don't meet either of these conditions, then it's just called non-cardiac chest pain. It's probably one of those other things. So it's very important. Uh, to know this. So the risk factors for uh, coronary artery disease, the more of these they have, the more likely it is to be coronary artery disease, and you know all of them. And by far, smoking is the single worst risk factor. If I had to name 10 things, uh, 10, 10, the top 10 things you can do to improve your, your heart or improve your heart health, smoking would be number one, Smoking would be number two, smoking would be number three, all the way through 10. The top 10 things to, to improve your cardiac uh, health would be to quit smoking. The rest of these are, are also associated with it, obviously, and you know them uh, very well. Um, next, we have some things called risk equivalents. Anybody who's had known coronary artery disease, um, if you've had a stroke or a heart attack or a cabbage or a stent or a previous heart attack or whatever it is, carotid disease, all your arteries are connected. So if you look at your artery starting with the head, which is a stroke or your, you know, your middle cerebral artery, and you start going down to your neck and you've had a carotid endarterectomy or your coronaries or your aorta, you had a, a, a aortic aneurysm, you got peripheral artery disease, uh, all your arteries are all connected. The last one that was added on um, is diabetes. If you have diabetes, you have coronary artery disease. It's just a matter of time uh, before we uh, discover it and or diagnose you with it. Um, so these are all risk equivalents. Um, the next thing to know when you're in the emergency room working down there is something called the Timmy Risk Score. This is a risk score that basically tells us, can I send this guy home or not? You know, you, you take all these seven factors and you add them all up. Age over 65, they get a point. If they've had aspirin within the last seven days prior to admission, not just when they walk through the door on the ambulance, but if they've been on aspirin or taken one in the last seven days, they're higher risk because they're having this chest pain and this heart attack while on aspirin. Um, or any three of the following, diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, tobacco, or a family history. Um, if they have known or, or previous coronary artery disease, they automatically get a point. And the, the key about chest pain is they have to have two episodes of chest pain lasting more than 20 minutes each episode um, in the last 24 hours. So two episodes of chest pain lasting more than 20 minutes in the last 24 hours. If a guy comes in saying, I've been having chest pain for the last hour continuously, then that obviously counts. 
You have to have non-negative cardiac markers, which includes indeterminate. And indeterminate troponin is definitely non-negative. And you have to have ST, ST deviation by more than 0.5 millimeters up or down. Uh, so it really doesn't matter. So how does this help us? You add up the score. If they have zero um, to two points, then they have a less percent, less than three percent chance of having an MI or death if you send them home right now within the next 14 to 30 days. Um, if the score goes up, you know, six or seven, 19 percent chance of death. If they're like the three to five range, you're between five percent to 12 percent. So the more of these they have, uh, the, the more likely you are to keep them in the hospital. You shouldn't send somebody home that has like score of three, four, or five. But if it's zero to two, you're, you're okay. Now the question is, you got to be smart. If it's just two points and the two points are a troponin of five and an ST elevation, well, they're not going anywhere. You know, you got to be smart doctors. These are guidelines and things to help us um, to determine what to do and, and to kind of teach us. But at the end of the day, you got to be smart. You can't send somebody home that has elevated ST segments and a positive troponin. So acute coronary syndrome, this breaks down into two major branches. We have a non-STEMI and a STEMI. Um, these used to be called non-QFMI and QFMI in the old uh, literature. Put a little Q there next to STEMI for a different reason. Um, but they used to be called non-QWAVE and QWAVE MI. Now we call them ST elevation MI and non-ST elevation MI. And it's a, uh, the ST elevation MI is a, a EKG diagnosis. You don't have to do anything special. You see ST elevation is on an EKG, bam, you got to do what you got to do. The treatment for ST elevation MI is open the artery. Either get them to a cath lab, which a lot of places have, or give them uh, thrombolytics and uh, send them uh, to a place that has a cath lab. Um, if you look at the above diagram in this, the circle, it looks like an eye almost looking at you, the red circle. That's an artery, and that's the lumen of the artery that's fully occluded. And that's a big red platelet fibrin uh, thrombin clot there, and that's a big red clot occluding the entirety of the lumen of the artery. That's the only thing that'll give you an ST elevation electrical pattern on a surface EKG. That injury pattern is from a completely occluded artery, a plaque ruptured or multiple plaque ruptures, um, whatever it is, but an artery is fully occluded at this time. On the other side is a non-STEMI, a plaque ruptured, but it's not fully occluded. There's still lumen and there's still blood going through there. So how do you know if somebody had a non-STEMI? On the ST elevation of my, you see it on the EKG and you're like, oh yeah, you know, you had a STEMI. On a non-STEMI, how do you know? Good. So they have positive troponins. Um, troponin is how you know. Troponin is like the perfect test. Um, thank God we have that now. But non-STEMI, they have a positive troponin, and we know there's myocardial damage, and they're infarcting as we speak. Um, so troponin gets treated with medical management. I'm sorry, so non-STEMI is treated with medical management, and then catham as soon as you can. Um, and it can go up to 72 hours. It doesn't have to be that day. So if they come in on a Friday night, it's not an emergency. You treat them medically, get them on all the right medications, and they can get a cath first thing Monday morning. So the medical management is in the middle between those two, and it's very simple. The whole thing that's causing chest pain is a oxygen and uh, oxygen supply and demand mismatch. So the key is to try to fix that uh, mismatch. And the way you do is by giving them oxygen. Um, other things you can do is decrease oxygen demand by making the heart contract less frequently um, and, and, and decreasing preload. And those are all things we're going to talk about. So the next thing you got to give them is aspirin. 325, they chew it, um, starts working within um, 20 minutes, 30 minutes tops. If they swallow it and you wait, it's going to take a few hours. Um, the next thing you got to give them is another antiplatelet agent. So aspirin is the first antiplatelet. The second one is either clopidogrel, prazogrel, uh, or tacagalor. Um, the the, the prazogrel is effiant and tacagalor is brilinta. Those are the newer agents. They've shown um, some superiority compared to just uh, clopidogrel and especially tacagalor, uh, brilinta. Uh, it's my favorite one at this time. Um, the next thing you want to do is give them something with, with uh, anti-ATP uh, uh, blockade as well as uh, um, some factor 10A blockade. So you can use heparin um, and or uh, enoxaparin. Um, we can use in the cath lab things called 2B3A inhibitors. They used to be um, started in the ER, uh, started upstream, uh, right down in the ER. You'd put them on an integral in a Rhea Pro drip. Nowadays, these are not used that often. We use them in the ER at our own, at, in the cath lab at our own discretion. Um, and the reason for that is we've started using higher and higher loading doses of clopidogrel. Um, 
Plavix now, we started using 600 loading doses and 300 in some places, but with the higher doses, uh, it seems like the uh, effect of the 2B3 inhibitors is not as important up front. But if you have a very complicated lesion and, and you're going to use lots of stents or whatnot, then the 2B3 inhibitors are important. Uh, the next thing is a statin. Why, why should they be on a statin? They walk through the door, say, ouch, I have chest pain, you shove a Lipitor 80 down their throat. Why? Well, Lipitor 80 or a Torvastatin 80 in the PROVE-IT trial, the Timmy 22B trial, was shown to re reduce mortality by another 20% in the acute setting within those uh, initial two weeks to a month. 30-day um, mortality was reduced by another 20%. So a lot of people think, well, cholesterol is a lifelong problem. Why do I need to be on uh, statin therapy this second? The second I walk through the door with uh, acute MI. And, and the reason is because what, how else do statins work? They don't just reduce your cholesterol. They reduce inflammation. They stabilize plaques. They improve the endothelial uh, lining and the endothelial function and how it works in relation to all your other platelets and fibrin and all the other stuff, the inflammatory milieu uh, that's going on in there. Um, and they kind of help calm everything down. The next one is a beta blocker. Um, the lower you get their heart rate, the better. We don't do IV beta blockers anymore. Um, nowadays, we give them PO. My, the easiest one to go to is 25 of PO metoprolol. It's not going to tank their blood pressure. It gets their heart rate down nicely. We want their heart rate right around 55 uh, or 60 beats uh, per minute. That causes a great, um, that causes the heart to reduce oxygen demand significantly more than anything else um, that we can do. They tested calcium channel blockers on this. Um, and they found that calcium channel blockers actually increase mortality. You got a heart that's ischemic and is barely beating very well. Suddenly you give it a calcium channel blocker and make the heart weaker. They thought, well, maybe it'll, the heart will use less oxygen if it doesn't contract as strong. Well, it turns out that that's just not the case and it actually increased mortality. So we don't do that. Beta blockers are also good because they block catecholamines. Um, and, and ultimately that helps re uh, improve remodeling. Um, but in the acute setting blocks that catecholamine surge and calms everything down uh, for the patient as well and allows healing and remodeling to, to start taking place. ACE inhibitors are something they should be started on within the first 24 to 48 hours. They do have to be discharged on this um, and it's also um, brings down their pressure, helps uh, remodeling, um, helps uh, prevent scar formation. Both of those beta blockers and ACEs are next to each other because they both prevent myocytes from becoming fibrocytes and prevent uh, scarring. The last one is keep their hemoglobin above 10. This isn't a, a, a tried and tested fact. Um, you know, just keep their hemoglobin close to what it should be. If they're always 9.8, 9.8, 9.8, .8, and they come in at like, you know, 9.3 or 2, don't worry about it. If they're always running at 11, 11, 11, and they come in at 9.5, it's not, you know, that exciting. If they come in at 5, 6, 7, and they're usually running above 10, then that could be a problem. Their myocardial ischemia is probably due to a lack of hemoglobin. Um, the optional drug that I've added there, see all these drugs in the middle are ones that improve mortality. Um, they improve mortality whether it's at 30 days or even up to 4 or 5 years. Um, these are the ones that have the greatest effect on surviving, survivability and mortality as well as um, not hurt and harming the heart and causing it to remodel poorly. The drug that's optional is nitroglycerin. It mainly functions as a venodilator. Um, what that does is prevent blood from getting back to the heart it dilates out your veins less blood gets back to your heart your heart doesn't have to work as strong reducing preload causes your heart to kind of relax and chill out because it doesn't have to work as hard um, the one it doesn't affect mortality either way um, but it makes the patients feel better um, the one drug that we say you shouldn't give is morphine um, 2005 the crusade trial or the crusade registry came out and said this causes mortality um, the crusade registry is a registry in north carolina um, at Duke University, North Carolina, and South Carolina, anybody comes in with ACS or proven um, ACS with uh, biomarkers and troponin is put into this registry. They looked back at all the people that came into North Carolina saying, ouch, I have chest pain. At the time, it was only 55,000 patients. Now it's well over 100,000. Um, they found a, a significant increase in mortality with people that got uh, morphine compared to people that didn't. It was almost 48% higher uh, mortality for people who did get morphine uh, versus the ones um, that didn't get any and the thought and then they went back and investigated to figure out why well morphine is a vaso and venodilator dilates out your arteries and your veins and it causes a uh, drop in perfusion pressure across your myocardium so you're taking an already ischemic myocardium and dropping perfusion pressure 
uh, across it even more. So you're increasing infarct size. In pig studies where they brought them in and included their LID um, and then gave them morphine or didn't and then treated them, they found the infarct size was bigger in all the ones that got uh, morphine. So stay away from this drug um, at all. I know in, in medical school they taught everybody Mona, um, but I want everybody to learn Bona, beta blockers. Beta blockers, oxygen, nitro, aspirin, clopidogrel, you know, prasugrel, tagagalor, heparin, anoxaparin, ACE inhibitors, all that stuff should come way before you get down to these things that, that make no difference um, and or actually kill you. So you should avoid those things. Now, if you look at the, the little Q wave I left there next to ST elevation MI, the reason for that is about 85% of STEMIs leave a Q wave on an EKG. It's an injury pattern that kind of persists on an EKG long after the uh, MI is over. Um, non STEMIs never do. Um, sometimes you get these funny calls from the emergency room. The doctor calls and says, Hey, I got this guy with chest pain. His, his EKG looks fine. Well, 90% 90, 90 of heart attacks, the EKG looks fine. Only about 10 15% are STEMIs. Um, the rest, the EKG looks like mine and yours. Um, so that there's no reason to get excited or, or wonder why the EKG looks fine. That's normal. Most heart attacks, it's, it's like that, 90% almost. Um, so don't get excited about that. Um, the box down there at the bottom left says the sob treatment. Anybody with coronary artery disease needs to be on a statin, aspirin, ACE inhibitor, and beta blocker. 94% reduction in mortality. Now, if they've received a stent, they should also be on one of those three other drugs. Uh, clopidogrel, prasugrel, tagagalor, you can easily add a C in there, make it scab or spab or, you know, some other way, You, however you want to spell it, stab. Um, I think stab is the best because I think Berlin is the best. Um, but either way, um, this is how you treat an acute of mine. Then we'll get into the EKGs for all of these. Um, real quickly, here's a diagram of the, the all the cardiac markers. Nobody really uses any of the other ones anymore now that we have troponin. Um, just for your board exams, though, they, you might be asked, myoglobin goes up first and, and is cleared the fastest, uh, then CK, and then, uh, well, they all kind of go up at the same time, except myoglobin can, can be elevated within an hour. Um, the rest of them takes about four to six hours to go up. Troponin can trail the longest. It can stay in your bloodstream 10 to 14 days. So it's good for timing things as well. Um, troponin is the gold standard. Um, a lot of people that trained in the 2000s and beyond don't even know what a CKMB is. A lot of times they call me from hospitals, you know, kind of out in the boonies, like, hey, I got a CK fraction of this and MB that. And I'm like, look, you know, just what's this troponin? I don't need anything else. Um, nothing else gives you an LVA troponin other than um, cardiac injury, ischemia, uh, MI, whatever it is. If somebody has something, their troponin is going to be positive. So you really don't need um, any other test. Now, sure, there are some other conditions that can cause you to be ischemic, like a PE. If you have a massive PE, your heart's going to be ischemic and your heart will leak troponin. Um, people with uh, renal injury or, or renal kidney, uh, end-stage renal disease, you have these huge massive volume shifts and they have this microvascular uh, angina. Um, these people definitely have ischemia. You take, you suck out two, three liters from them once or twice a week, and then they put it back on and you got these huge volume shifts. Their heart is always ischemic and they can't clear it. So they have troponin positive for multiple reasons. Um, but almost every condition like sepsis or, you know, real bad heart failure, whatever it is, there's always something causing, um, either hypoxemia, um, hypotension. There's a reason why the heart is ischemic and not all of it is coronary artery disease, but troponin only comes from the heart. It's very, very specific. The next section is on ST elevations. Um, so there's two sets of leads in the heart. You got the limb leads over on the left of the EKG, usually in the, in the chest leads or the V leads over on the right. Um, on the limb leads, up to one millimeter of ST elevation is okay. Lots of people have that. It's no big deal. On the chest leads, up to three millimeters okay. There's lots of people running around with three millimeters of ST elevation. Nobody cares. They're not having heart attacks. That's just how it is. That's just, that's what they are. Now, if it's more than that, then it's a problem. But that's what we usually say is is the up to up to one on one side, and three on the other is considered that can be normal. Now, any new elevation is not okay. Um, if somebody has new elevations, then it's not okay. And the shape uh, of them can can make a difference. On the limb lead side, the shape really doesn't matter. They all the ST elevations they all look the same anyways. So an ST elevation is an ST elevation, doesn't really matter. On the chest lead side, it makes a huge difference. The shape does matter. If it's that shape right there, that's an acute MI. If you put two dots on top of that dome, that, and, and that, that dome can be a smile, it's a very sad smiley face. Um, whereas it was concave uh, 
upwards, which is the benign kind of ST elevation, and you put two dots on it, it's smiling at you. It's not a big deal. So please remember that the shape matters on this side only. And we'll see a lot of EKGs um, and be able to tell. Um, so what's the order of events in ST elevation am I? This is always an interesting question. So the first thing you see is actually something called hyperacute T waves. If you look at that first box there at the top, they're wide, broad, symmetrical T waves. Eventually the ST segments go up, and then your T waves uh, can invert, and then ultimately will leave a Q wave if it's big enough uh, of an MI. Um, may not always leave a Q wave, but if it's big enough, it will. STEMIs always evolve. Please remember this. You cannot be having a STEMI if all your EKGs look the same. Um, so keep getting EKGs, plaster the wall with EKG paper. If you have a patient coming in saying, ouch, I have chest pain, and you're not sure, you know, you got, you think there's a half a millimeter elevation or a one millimeter, keep getting EKGs. EKG paper is free. If he's having an MI, he, he, he'll, he'll evolve. He will show you. He'll tell you he's having an MI. If all the EKGs, if you do one every minute for the next 15 minutes and they all look the same, patient's not having an ST elevation MI. Um, so keep keep checking EKGs. Um, T waves on an EKG uh, can mean different things. Hyperkalemic T waves in very low grade hyperkalemia are those narrow, um, symmetric pointed ones there that you see. Um, hyperacute ischemia, kind of like what we said in the beginning of an acute MI, and it's called hyperacute. It's because we never see them on an EKG. The patient's still at home. He doesn't want to come in yet. His wife is still trying to convince him uh, to come in, but. They're called hyperacute T waves. When we do catch them on, on, on an EKG, they only last about 10, 15 minutes or so, and then the ST elevation uh, begins. But they're wide and broad, and they're not as sharp um, as the hyperkalemia ones. And then you got normal variant. It goes up slowly and comes down sharp. It's not symmetrical. It goes up slowly and then comes down sharper. Um, so those are the ones that are normal variant. So looking at ST segments and T waves, ST depressions do not localize, and I can't stress this enough. Ischemia does not localize. Um, I can't tell you how many times an EKG is read as inferior ischemia, or anterior ischemia, lateral ischemia. It just doesn't happen. You cannot localize ischemia. If the patient has depressions and they have real ischemia, you will see them in all the leads uh, everywhere. The most sensitive leads are lead 2 and lead V5. Um, those ones will be depressed, and they, that makes no anatomical sense. We know from stress testing that ischemia does not localize. Um, an ST elevation in an MI, the QT corrected interval is usually over 425 milliseconds. Now, T wave inversions can localize. So if somebody has an anterior T wave inversions, that could be an anterior MI. Excuse me. That could be an anterior MI, but it could be other stuff too. Um, deep inverted T waves can signify ischemia uh, or CNS injury or an acute MI. It could also be a PE, uh, anterior, uh, anterior deep inverted uh, T waves. So uh, next, next slide. T wave inversions um, also can mean an acute MI, especially with a prolonged QT interval. Um, same as the ST elevations, usually over 425. Early repolarization and pericarditis are different. Um, they're more benign forms of persistent ST elevations, but they all usually have a QT interval this, that's less than 400 uh, milliseconds. So it's important to uh, keep that in mind. 88% of patients with a PE will have anterior T wave inversions. Keep that in mind. That's, uh, that's pretty accurate there. Wellens syndrome or Wellens criteria on an EKG is, is a little bit confusing. It may be beyond the... Uh, scope of this. This was kind of more applicable when we didn't uh, have troponins too much. But Wellens syndrome is tempting to diagnose Wellens syndrome with anterior T wave inversions, but Wellens T waves simply look a lot different. Um, they should have a longer QTC. Um, they generally don't extend all the way out to V6 and most importantly don't have T wave inversions um, in lead three. Uh, so keep an eye on that. We have a couple EKGs that, that probably have that on there, uh, but it's really not that important now that we have troponin. Um, next, uh, look at this EKG here. Um, this is basically what the EKG looks like. You got your limb leads are 1, 2, and 3, R, L, and F. Your V leads or your chest leads are one, V1 through V6. This is um, kind of all the different parts they represent on a, uh, on a uh, you know, I put all the walls together. Like the magenta, for example, is what? 
septal walls, the blue ones are the anterior wall, etc. Here on the next slide, you'll see I put the words next to each wall. You got your lateral, your inferior, anterior, septor, septal, and posterior. Um, I kind of threw in the, the, the blood vessels that feed those. The circ does your uh, laterals, your RCA is mainly your inferiors, and your LAD does your septals um, and anterior. Posterior is fed by the RCA as well as the LAD, so it can be tricky. So reciprocal changes are important. Inferior reciprocates to AVL and 1. Anterior reciprocates to, to inferior. And the lateral also uh, reciprocates to inferior. The key I want you to get out of this is nothing reciprocates to anterior. And you'll see why this is important once we start doing the EKGs. Because if you have ST depressions in the anterior leads, those aren't depressions. That's an acute MI. That's a posterior uh, acute MI. Those are not uh those are not depressions. Those are not reciprocal changes. That is an acute posterior ST elevation MI. There's no reason to flip the EKG paper up in the air and look through the light and do all these silly things. Just imagine what the patient's family is going to think of you. If you look at this EKG and you flip it over and you're looking at the light and they're like, you know, what are these people outside the door doing? Are they confused? Are they not doctors? Don't they know how to look at an EKG? I mean, like, you know, what's going on here? Somebody tell me something. Um, so let's not do that. V1 through V3. If they're depressed, it's an acute uh, posterior MI. 80% of uh, heart attacks are RCA or right coronary artery heart attacks. The, the rest are all left. And there's a difference in how they present because the RCA feeds the SA nodal branch and the AV nodal branch as well as the um, RV. Patients are bradycardic, hypotensive. Um, everything is kind of going slow. They have arrhythmias and bradycardia. Um, the ones on the left, everything's a little hyped up. It, it's very painful because it's the anterior wall, which is about 80% of your myocardium. Um, they're hypertensive, mildly, mildly tachycardic. Um, there's pain, there's anxiety. Tachycardia, a lot of tachycardia doesn't go with, with uh, acute MI, but just mild, you know, 100, 110, 120. Um, but you can tell from across the room which kind of heart attack they're having uh, based on how they're acting and, and what their EKG, from what their heart rate is from far away. So here's your coronary arteries, your RCA is right there, feeds the SA node, then the RV, then it splits into the PDA and PLA, and then you have the AV nodal branch coming off of there. Um, the left coronary artery separates out into your LAD and CERC. Your CERC kind of goes out to the sides and feeds your laterals through OMs. Um, the LAD gives you septals down to the septal uh, part of your heart, and then the diagonals uh, and the rest of the LAD feeding the um, front wall. So this slide, I tried to kind of superimpose the arteries with the places they go. You can see the LAD kind of goes to the anterior. The CERC uh, kind of goes out to that um, V6 and all that. And the RCA obviously feeds the inferior stuff. So one very important uh, type of infarct that must be discussed to separate the children from the adults in terms of medicine, um, especially if you're an ER doctor, you need to recognize this right away, especially if you're a cardiologist or a medicine uh, physician as well, but RV infarcts are very, very important. Um, it's if you have an RCA infarct high enough, you affect the RV branch and it knocks out your RV. Um, so what is the point of an RV or, or even an LV? What is the point of your ventricles? When they contract, they push blood forward either into your pulmonary artery or your aorta, but when they relax, they suck bl blood back to themselves. That's very, very important. Uh, so it's important for them to relax. If you have an RV infarct and your RV is not relaxing, it's not sucking blood back to itself. That's why you get those symptoms of JVD, uh, leg edema, um, and hypotension. The reason you get the hypotension is there's no more preload. The heart is not filling. Uh, the left ventricle is not filling, so it cannot generate a pressure. It's pumping, you know, almost no blood. Your lungs are clear, so when it when the LV contracts and relaxes, it sucks blood out of the lungs and pushes it forward. But if your RV isn't able to push that blood forward into the lungs, you're gonna have no preload, and your heart doesn't pump very efficiently or very well at all. That's why you get hypotensive. So on an exam, they're gonna ask you. Patient comes in with an acute MI, has inferior ST elevations, blah, blah, blah. Here's his physical exam. They're going to give you hypotensive, slightly tachycardic, uh, maybe even with bradycardia as if, if the AV um, branches out. Um, and they're going to be hypotensive. Uh, they're going to have JVP or JVD. They're going to have leg edema, and their lungs will be clear. This is important. The lungs will be clear. Those are your signs and symptoms. So how do you treat this? you got to fill up their preload. 
they're preload dependent. You've got to tank them up. You give them lots and lots of fluids. Um, lots of studies have been done on this. 95% of people need about 18 liters of fluids. Of course, you're never going to do this in the ER. Um, one way to know that you've filled them up enough is that you start hearing it in their lungs. You either hear rails and crackles in their lungs, means you filled them up enough, or their FiO2 um, requirement goes up. They were on zero liters of nasal cannula or one or two liters. Now you've had to crank them up to three or four or more than that. Once you can hear it in their lungs, you've filled them up enough. Uh, but we never usually get to that. They're usually in the cath lab and they're um, having their RCA uh, opened up. Um, the treatment for this is also to wipe off uh, the nitroglycerin. Sometimes they've gotten nitro in the ambulance and you can't really do anything about it, but if somebody put nitro paste on them, you take the nitro paste off. Things you don't ever want to give are beta blockers, nitro, and morphine. That just worsens the hypotensin, the hypotension and or the bradycardia. Nitro shouldn't be given in any MI uh, ever. Um, you can read some of my other articles or videos uh, to find out why. Um, it's beyond the scope of this, but you shouldn't give them any of these things. It's going to worsen their hemodynamics. Um, how do you diagnose an RV infarct? If you look at this diagram I drew here, um, lead two uh, mainly is the LV inferior wall, and lead three is mainly the RV. So if you look at ST elevations, if the ST elevation in lead three is higher than lead two, then you have an RV infarct. If the ST elevation uh, in lead too high is is higher than it's mainly an a, um, inferior wall uh, infarct. So this is very very sensitive and specific. It's actually more sensitive and specific in in some studies um, than a, than a uh, right sided EKG. So you don't really need to do a right sided EKG. All the information that's that you need is contained uh, right here. If you want to do a quick cheap right sided EKG, just take V4. Um, from under the left nipple and just put it under the right nipple and just print another EKG. If it's elevated, um, then you have an RV infarct. But like I said, you really don't need to do that. All the information is contained within the normal EKG. If the ST elevation in 3 is higher, the injury pattern is going mainly towards um, the RV. The one thing I want to say about tachycardia is you should doubt an ST elevation or an acute MI diagnosis um, when when there's a lot of tachycardia, unless it's compensatory and somebody's in cardiogenic shock or something, but tachycardia does not generally go with an acute MI. Um, cardiogenic shock can lead to tachycardia, obviously. Listen to the lungs, look at their legs, try to figure out what your patient really has. Volume resuscitate the patient, that should get their tachycardia down. Um, get good at bedside echoes, especially if you're an ER physician. Um, look at the walls, know what they look like when they're normal so that you know what to find, what to see when it's not normal. It's not that hard. You know, does it look like they have a good squeeze or is like all the other walls moving and just pulling one along with them? Are they really having an MI or not? And you can actually get paid for this. One of the ER, ER residents uh, at the hospital where I'm at now is was just phenomenal. He called me down and said, hey, doc, I think we got a uh, pericardial infusion that's causing tamponade. This, this guy is confused. Blood pressure is dropping, not doing very well. Come take a look at this. Right away, I called the echo tech and said, hey, meet me in the ER, but he already had his machine down there, and he was showing me, and, and, and it was. He really definitely had a tamponade. Um, I wanted clearer pictures as well, so when we do a, our tap, we can also look and make sure we got rid of all of it. So we saved the pictures on our machine, but he did a good job. It's probably saved the guy's life. So get good at it. You can get paid for it. So an anterior infarct... Um, in an anterior STEMI, the R wave will be less than 13 millimeters in V4. If you look at V4, the R wave is always under 13 millimeters. That's an injury pattern. Um, the QT corrected interval is always over 392. The ST elevation at 60 milliseconds after the J point, which is right where that area where the S kind of comes up, is greater than 2 millimeters. If you have two out of three of these, uh, of these above, you have an ST elevation MI with greater than 90% sensitivity and specificity. So remember these, and when we go through the EKGs, we'll, we'll look for these. If somebody has an inferior MI with focal deficits, you got to be very careful. They come in saying, ouch, I have chest pains going down my left arm, but their left arm is actually weak. Um, not just tingling or painful, but weak, like they can't move their arm. They can't lift it up. They can't pick it up. What do you want? You got to get a CT chest, make sure they're not having an aortic dissection that's dissecting down the RCA, which is what's giving them the inferior MI and the ST elevations in the RCA, as well as into that right carotid. They're, they're right there next to each other. They both come off the same side of the aorta, going up into the MCA and giving you that left-sided weakness. Um, so weakness of the left arm or leg, um, is never ACS. It has to be neurologic. Make sure you keep your eyes open for that. 
it. Now, what if somebody still has angina? You put them on all the drugs, you know, whatever it is, you calm them down, you're going to admit them, they keep having persistent, persistent chest pain. It's not getting any better. You got them on all the nitro. And when we're talking about nitro drip, we're talking about real nitro. Every one of those sublingual nitros that you give them, 400 micrograms. So don't put them on a drip at 5 mics or 10 mics or 20 mics and tell me I tried titrated it up from 16. That's nothing. When they got three sublingual nitros, that's 1,200 mics. So put them on like 60, 80, go up to 120. Um, and then tell me um, that their chest pain is not well controlled. And then get their heart rate down. Get their heart rate down around 55, 60. If, you, if their heart rate down and they're on nitro and they're still in pain, then you know they're going to the cath lab. Um, the next section is called scarbosis criteria. This is how do you, how can you tell somebody's having an acute MI if they have a left bundle branch block? Because it's very tricky with a left bundle branch block. You don't always get the ST segment elevations and you can't really see everything. So concordant ST elevation on at least one millimeter in at least uh, one lead, they get five points. Concordant ST depression in, in V1 through V3, leads that always usually have a negative QRS uh, with a left bundle branch block. That gives them three points. And five millimeters of discordant uh, ST elevation leads with a negative QRS, um, which is excessive discordance. They get two points because it was only, quote, 89% specific, whereas the other ones were way more specific. So here's a picture of it. If you look at leads one and two down to the left here, um, concordance is um, the QRS deflection is upright, and you got ST elevation going upright and a T wave going upright. Um, in the middle there, you got like V1 or V2. That looks like a V2 kind of lead or a V3 kind of lead. Um, that one, any ST elevation greater than five millimeters is not normal. Um, you know, in, in, in the left bundle branch block, it can be up to five, and we'll say that's okay. Um, in the anterior chest leads, um, the uh, they have to be um, going down uh, in V1 through V3, for example. If you have an ST depression, going down with the left bundle branch block as well as the ST um, elevation of the T wave. So this is just a picture format of it and these are real tricky. Thank God we have troponins nowadays. You can check that and you're usually pretty quick. Next we'll talk about the arrhythmias. Um, they're either narrow or wide. We'll talk about the wide ones first because that's the easiest. In a wide uh, rhythm tachycardia, you can only have really a, a couple of options. It's either VTAC or VFib, which um, we'll look at EKGs and you'll see what it looks like. Or you could have something called SVT with aberrancy. Um, the word aberrancy just means aberrant conduction or there's slow conduction through the uh, one of the bundle branches. Either you have a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block. SVT just means it's one of the rhythms over here on the side. It's a narrow um it's one of the top uh, narrow rhythms coming up from the supraventricular area, um, but the left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block is what makes it look wide and make it look like VTAC. Um, so that's what the wide ones look like. The narrow ones, we call them SVTs, supraventricular tachycardia. All that means is it's not originating in the ventricles. If it was, it'd be ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Um, anything above that um, is called an SVT. Now, they don't have to be tachycardic. They don't have to be... Uh, tachycardic, almost all of these have an equivalent uh, that isn't tachycardic. So instead of sinus tach, it would be sinus rhythm. Instead of atrial tach, it would be an atrial ectopic rhythm. Instead of junctional tach, it would be a junctional rhythm, and etc. So sinus rhythm or sinus tach is the normal uh, response to exercise, hypovolemia, fever. If a patient is in sinus tach, it's an appropriate response to some uh, some uh, some disturbance going on in their body. They have a fever. They're hypovolemic, hypotensive. Um, maybe they took a medication. Maybe they just exercised. If I stand up right now and start running in place, I will be going to sinus tach. Um, it's usually a slow. You slowly go into sinus tach and slowly come out of it. Um, if you don't, then it's probably some other rhythm. It's a sudden onset or sudden offset. It's probably something else. So sinus tachycardia is uh, pretty normal, and I wouldn't uh, get too uh, excited about it. atrial tachycardia or an atrial ectopic rhythm. It's a different P wave. The atrial um, contraction is occurring, but it's coming from somewhere else. There's another spot in the atria somewhere that's triggering this automatic uh, rhythm. And, uh, you know, you got to look for it. Um, usually the P waves will be upside down. If it's coming low from the right atrium, the P waves will be retrograde, activating the atria, and it'll look upside down. Junctional tachycardia is just a rhythm coming from the junction, which does include the AV node. It could be a junctional rhythm. We call it a junctional rhythm if it's slow. Usually junctional rhythms are in the range of about 40 uh, to 60. Anything over 60, we call it uh, junctional rhythm. 
Um, anything uh, higher than that, we call it junctional tachycardia. The way you know it's a junctional rhythm is there's no P waves. Um, if it's if it's slow, we call it junctional bradycardia, obviously. Um, but there's no P waves at all. There's only a few rhythms that give you no P waves, so keep that in mind. Um, the next two, four and five, are both irregularly irregular. That's why I put that there. You have uh, MAT, which is multi multifocal atrial tachycardia. Um, this just means that there's multiple um, areas in the atria that are firing um, and causing three or more different looking P waves. You have to have at least three or more different looking P waves. Uh, because if you have two different P waves only, then that's the sinus P wave and an ectopic atrial uh, extra P wave. So that puts you as an, at an ectopic atrial rhythm. So it has to be at least three or more. Usually this is due to lung disease or some kind of lung pathology. If you fix the lungs, you'll fix the rhythm. Uh, the next one is atrial fibrillation. I have a whole lecture on this. Click through the through the YouTube videos and you'll find it. Atrial fibrillation is an irregularly regular rhythm with no P waves. So this is the second one with no P waves. Um, basically, the atria just fibrillate or kind of quiver. Um, they're firing randomly from all over the place, tiny little firings, and those tiny little firings um, ultimately uh, trigger the AV node at various uh, times, um, and that's why you end up with a narrow rhythm. As long as it triggers through the AV node, you end up with a narrow tachycardia. You end up uh, traveling down the bundle of his, and both atria, both ventricles contract at the same exact time. And that's what makes it narrow. All, all the surface EKG picks up is a right and a left ventricle. Both contract together. That gives you that powerful uh, QRS that's narrow. Um, if there's any kind of bundle branch block or delay, um, one ventricle will fire before the other, and that's why you get that wide um, electrical signal on the uh, surface EKG. Um, atrial flutter is real simple. It's it's this big macro reentrant tachycardia. Basically, if you look at the tricuspid valve, it's this loop uh, going around the tricuspid valve um, that gives you that very uh, traditional sawtooth pattern on the um, the EKG, and, and you'll pick that up right away when you see it. Um, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. Um, this is the tachycardia when everybody says, "Oh, he's an SVT. He's an SVT." Um, that's what they mean. They, he, they mean he's an AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. This is a tachycardia within the AV node. Um, it's usually pretty fast. Um, this also has no P wave. If there is a P wave, sometimes it's buried in the QRX, QRSs and you can't really find it, or sometimes it shows up after the QRS. Um, but basically there's no P wave. Um, so now you have th three without a P wave. Junctional tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, and AVNRT. AFib is easy to figure out. It's irregularly irregular. But what about junctional tachycardia? If you have somebody tacking away at 110, 120, how do you know he's not an AVNRT? Well, the way you know is the rhythm gives it away. Um, and, or the rate, I'm sorry. The rate gives it away. Junctional tachycardia, they can be a little bit tachycardic. They can get up to like 110, 120 at the most. Uh, but they will not get any faster than that. AVNRT, these people are really tachycardic. They're like 220, 240, 260, sometimes 280, 180. Um, these people are pretty, pretty tachycardic, and that's usually how you know. Um, AVRT, the last one, AV uh, reentrant tachycardia. Um, these are accessory pathways within the uh, uh, ventricles or atria. The most common example uh, of these is WPW syndrome or Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, there's an accessory pathway either on the left or right um, between the ventricles and atria, and it's causing um, conduction uh, to go through there. So this is your basic heart, um, and this is your SA node up there, firing down to your AV node, going down the bundle of His, then going down to the right side, which is a single branch, and then to the left side where there's two branches, there's the left anterior fascicle, the word fascicle just means branch, or the uh, left posterior fascicle, which also um, means branch. Uh, but this is basically how it happens. If you draw a line here across the uh, AV um, line, which I did, I draw that line straight across and I made it longer and wider than the heart. Um, anything above that is supraventricular. Anything below that obviously is ventricular. And um, we'll go through EKGs and you'll see. So anything that actually hits the AV node will give you a narrow um, tachycardia, unless there's block below that, like a left bundle or a right bundle. Um, but any of those rhythms that come from on top and hit the AV node, as long as your AV node and, and infrahissian system conducts properly, you'll get narrow rhythms. Um, next, we'll take a look at AV blocks. 
Um, first degree AV block all the way over here. Your PR interval is greater than 200. That's very simple. It's one large box. Second degree AV block is a little tricky. There's, it's called second degree AV block. You see group beating. If you look at that little uh, picture there, I got three beats together, then a gap, then three beats together. That's kind of what it looks like on an EKG. You see groups of beats uh, together. There's two kinds. There's Mobitz type 1 or type 1 AV, uh, second degree AV block where the PR interval prolongs, then it drops. Um, type 2, the PR interval is constant, then it drops. Um, and that's your basic uh, breakdown. Um, third degree is um, the, the, probably the hardest one to figure out out of all of these. Um, the PR uh, interval is very variable. Um, they'll never match up. Sure, sometimes coincidentally you may have one PR interval look like the other, but they're very variable. Always look for third degree block in people that are bradycardic. It's very, very tricky. If somebody's bradycardic, keep your eyes peeled, see if they have third degree AV block. I drew a line right down the middle, that dotted line. On the left side, these people don't typically need a pacer. On the right side, um, these people typically need a pacer. The reason is um, type 1 uh, uh, AV block, first degree AV block, and second degree AV block type 1, uh, both usually happen at the AV node or higher, um, whereas uh, type 2 and 3 are all um, below the node, or they call them in infrahissian. Um, type 2 second degree AV block usually decompensates and becomes 3 uh, rather quickly. Now, if, you're, if your first degree AV block is symptomatic, then they automatically qualify for a pacemaker. So it does say no pacer, but if either of those two are symptomatic, then they do get a pacemaker. So ACLS protocols for emergency physicians are, are pretty simple. You have you either have asystole or PEA um, with chest, you know, or you have VFib and VTAC. And the treatment is very simple. Um, and in VTAC, we mean pulseless VTAC. We don't mean the patient's in there talking to you in VTAC. I mean like they're crashing, they're, they're confused, they're hypotensive, they're, they're not making any sense. So the treatment there is chest compressions, defibrillate, epinephrine, or amio, procainamide, lidocaine, um, stable VTAC. Now the guidelines say you should give them procainamide instead. And of course, unstable VFib or VTAC, you give them 300 uh, of amiodarone. Asystole is real simple. Chest compressions, epinephrine, and vasopressin you can use. Um, no atropine, no bicarb. Those have been taken out uh, of the uh, guidelines a long time ago. Um, they don't contribute anything more than, than what this already does. And you should not rush to intubate. Airway is last. It's no longer the ABCs. You know, it's circulation, circulation, circulation. Um, here in a hospital setting, it might be a little bit different uh, because, you know, you have staff there and everybody can do different things. Somebody could be doing chest compressions while somebody's intubating, so it won't be a problem. The one thing that they found with this that prolongs life the most is early defibrillation and very good chest compressions early on without stopping chest compressions. Um, and of the two, VFib and VTAC uh, has a much better survival rate, asystole and PEA. You know, usually the person's been in VFib for a long time and ultimately ends up in asystole or PEA. But asystole and PEA almost never come back. So the next thing, if somebody comes in with a rhythm that is fast and narrow, you know, you want to figure out what is this? Is it AFib or sinus tac? Or is it AVNRT or what, what you guys call SVT? Is it a supraventricular tachycardia? Um, and the one it usually is that we're worried about is AVNRT. So you could do vagal maneuvers or you can give them adenosine. Um, if you think it's AVNRT, if it's if it's irregular, it's probably AFib. If it's too fast, sometimes you can't tell that it's AFib. Um, sinus tach, you can usually tell. Um, even if it's pretty fast, you can tell. But sometimes it's so fast you can't tell, and you can't really see the P waves. So AVNRT has no P waves, or they come way after the QRS. They're buried deep in a T segment. Um, but either way, if you give them adenosine or do vagal maneuvers, some sometimes that'll convert them. If it doesn't convert them, well, what did it look like uh, when they didn't convert? Does it still does it look like AFib or sinus tac or does it does it still look like the SVT? It's very very important. One time they called me from the ER. They're like, "Hey, Dr. Allo, we got a patient for you." I'm like, "Yeah, what's going on?" They're like, "We shocked them three times." I'm like, "Well, what are you saying? What do they have?" I'm like, "Well, they were really really fast. They were an SVT. We gave them uh, adenosine and, and we had to shock them." I was like, "Well, when you gave them adenosine, what did you see?" They're like, "Oh, he went into AFib." Well, then the answer is obvious. His, he was going so fast that you couldn't see the P waves. He actually had AFib. Um, is what happened, um, and you give them adenosine, it slows them down enough, and then you see the AFib, and then they have AFib, you should move over to the other side and start treating them this way. So let's say you diagnose them with AFib or sinus tac, you can put them on beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Um, Esmolol is a very beta-specific beta blocker, it only slows your heart rate down. 
Um, something like diltiazem or acartazem drip um, is also very good at slowing your heart rate down without too much other consequences. Even people in heart failure, if you're not really sure, um, it seems like with diltiazem they'll be okay. Um, so diltiazem is a good choice to start as well as esmolol. Um, that'll slow them down. Get their heart rate down to around 100, 110, 120 at the most. Um, and then we'll go from there. The next thing they could come in with is a fast and wide rhythm. Fast and wide rhythms can be one of two things. It's either VTAC um, or like a VFib maybe um, or SVT with aberrancy. SVT with aberrancy is like what we discussed above. It's just any um, of those supraventricular rhythms that we talked uh, about above with a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block, which is what makes it look wide. So if it's SVT with aberrancy, I'm sorry, if it's VTAC and you give them amiodarone or pericainamide or lidocaine or something, they're still in VTAC or it didn't change, um, what did happen? Did they slow down at all? Because AFib will slow down with amiodarone. Um, you know, even sinus tac would slow down with amiodarone. So the question is, what do they really have? If it's SVT um, that's running real fast, you can slow them down with the same thing, diltiazem or esmolol, or even something like PO, metoprolol, whatever it is. Something that's very beta-specific that will slow their heart rate down without um, changing their hemodynamics. A lot of times I get the question, well, how good is a stress test? A guy just came into the ER with chest pain and he had a stress test three months ago. Well, look, you, you got to understand what a stress test is telling us. It's telling us whether or not they have significant coronary artery disease, not unstable coronary artery disease. You know, it tells us whether or not they have stable lesions in their coronaries of 50% or more. Um, it tells us about stable coronary artery disease. It has nothing to do with ST elevation and myer non stemmy You could still have a STEMI or non stemmy with a normal stress test. If you had a normal stress test yesterday, you could still come in today after a plaque ruptured with a STEMI. Now, a non stemmy and a STEMI is an acute plaque rupture. It can happen at any time to any one of us at any age. Um, we can even cath you. Let's say I cath you today and you go home. You could have a heart attack tomorrow. Your cath was perfectly clean, but a plaque, an unstable plaque ruptures perfectly possible um, so don't don't worry um, too much about stress tests if a guy comes in saying you know I get chest pain when I exert myself and then it goes away when I rest or blah 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 then sure stress test can help us risk stratify a person with stable coronary artery disease um, but it does not tell us about acute plaque ruptures STEMIs or non STEMIs hyperkalemia um, can be an EKG emergency um, it it it, uh, it it gets stratified into three different levels. You got mild, moderate, uh, as well as elevated. If it's somewhat elevated, five and a half to about six and a half, you get those narrow, tall, sharp T waves in a normal QT interval. If it goes a little higher, QRS widens out. It gets flatter. You get wide P waves. You get first degree AV block, and your T waves actually look pretty normal. If it's very very elevated, you lose your P waves completely. They're totally flattened out. The QRS is very very wide. They're bradycardic. The distal portion of the QRS is longer and stretched out, especially the uh, S is pulled along and stretched out. They got prolonged QRS with ST elevations and all kinds of arrhythmias, and the T waves really don't even exist um, at this point. The one thing I'll tell you is that one person's mildly elevated potassium may be too high for them if they've never had it before. So if somebody's 5.6 and they've never had a potassium at 5.6, they could show stage 3 hyperkalemia on an EKG or stage 2. They don't have to show uh, stage 1. These people who are diabetic, who are used to having potassium swing between 2.8 and up to 7.6, those people, they're not going to show hyperkalemia on an EKG. Um, they're just used to having various different potassiums. Um, and it really doesn't matter. So one person's potassium um, does not, it, it could be low, it could be high compared to somebody else. It just really depends on what that person um, has. Cocaine angina is uh, very interesting. There's a lot of reasons why cocaine angina can mimic an MI. First of all, it causes vasospasm of all your coronary arteries, causes very high uh, blood pressure, it causes catecholamine release, it causes all kinds of things. Um, you get this very strong alpha uh, vasoconstriction of your coronaries. I mean, it just does a lot of stuff. Um, so if they're hypertensive and anxious and tachycardic, you want to treat them with anti-ischemic medications as well as anti-anxiety medications, nitroglycerin, non-selective uh, beta blockers, you know, something like uh, labetalol, uh, for example, or carvedilol, um, diltiazem, benzodiazepines. Um, you really want to calm the anxiety down more than anything. That's going to help you the most. Um, is getting the anxiety level down. Usually something like Versed um, or benzodiazepines will, will be your best uh, bet. You definitely want to still keep track of their troponin and keep getting serial EKGs. They may improve 
um, with the above treatments and they may get better and they, they may evolve. The next one is pericarditis. There's three different stages or four different stages of pericarditis on an EKG. It can, it can um, look um, pretty confusing. Um, you have diffuse ST elevations, but they're the wrong shape. There's no reciprocal changes. And the key is you get PR depression in leads one and two on the limb lead side. Leads one and two look for PR depression. Now that's just stage one pericarditis. The rest of pericarditis doesn't look anything like that on EKG. Um, but the symptoms of pericarditis are usually positional and pleuritic. So watch out for that. Um, there are normal variants called benign early repolarization. Um, you can have benign T-wave inversions. Young African-American males as well as highly trained athletes uh, can have benign T-wave inversions. Um, you can also have uh, benign early repolarization, ST elevations that are seen in V4 and V5, all of this. Uh, goes with being a young African-American male. You can also have something called persistent juvenile pattern. Normal and African-American women, V1 uh, through V3, they usually have ST uh, elevations. So how do you manage these normal variants? Keep checking EKGs. If it's normal for that person, it's not going to evolve and it's not going to change. If it changes, starts going up, does something different, you have an ST elevation MI in progress. My rules for EKG reading, uh, and this is pretty uh, simple, um, but but I came up with these rules just because I've seen so many things missed. All EKGs must be read and examined by a physician, no matter what the mach machine says, especially if the machine says normal. Um, so all EKGs should be looked at and read uh, by a physician. Next rule, anyone at any age can have an MI. We've had 26-year-olds and 30-year-olds have an MI. Sure, it's very, very rare and unusual and they have some underlying thing going on or they, you know, they're just heavy, heavy smokers, but it can happen. So don't write it out. Oh, 26-year-old, oh, it's nothing. No, look at it. The next one I'll say is please compare the EKG to a previous one if you have it. If you have a previous one, look at it. If it looks the same, don't worry about it. Um, if it's changing or looking different, then it really depends on what the change is. If it's like a little T-wave inversion here and there, not a big deal. Um, but if it's like some, you know, massive elevations or ischemia all over the place or, you know, huge inverted wide um, T-waves, then that's a problem. The last rule I came up with is if they have a left bundle branch block on their EKG and you don't have a previous EKG, it really doesn't matter if there's no chest pain involved. If they came in for like a fractured toe and somebody did an EKG and they saw a left bundle branch block and said, oh my God, we don't have a previous uh, EKG, or they looked at a previous EKG from a year ago and there was no left bundle branch block, oh my God, oh my God, they're having a heart attack. No, they're not. They actually have to have chest pain to have a heart attack. People can develop left bundle branch blocks as their wiring gets older. The older you are, the more likely you are to have that. So here are some ways to find me, Facebook, my website, my blog. You can go to my, my diet website as well, allodiet.com. Now we're going to go through a lot of EKGs together. We're on slide 51. There's 120 slides. All the rest of these are EKGs, and we're going to read them uh, together. This is the most interesting part uh, of this talk. I hope you enjoyed this part leading up to this, but these are the emergency EKGs that you better know. So our first EKG here... Um, is you know you look at all the segments you look at it you try to figure out what's going on with it there's not really anything going on every qrs is preceded by a p every p has a qrs behind it you look at one and two they're both upright if you looked at if you watch the basic ekg course you know that's normal access um avf also upright so you don't have right access um deviation or anything lead one looks good no real elevated st segments or anything so we don't have really anything too exciting your next uh ekg here looks like a um rather fast rhythm. Um, you don't see uh, P waves. It's very, very fast. The rate is in the neighborhood of probably 160, 150 or so. If you look at V3, you see these little blips in the ST segments. Those are probably your P waves. Your P waves are coming after the QRSs. This is your basic AVNRT or, or what most people call um, uh, SVT. So this is SVT. The question is it's, it's narrow and fast. When it's narrow and fast, you want to make sure it's not AFib, you don't see P waves, but it's way too regular and it's not fast enough where AFib you can't tell. Um, could be sinus tack, but then you'd clearly see uh, you'd clearly see P waves uh, before that and, and you actually really don't. So that's not um, sinus tack. So the next EKG here is wide and fast. Remember we had narrow and fast and wide and fast, so what do you want to do with this? Um, this is clearly VTAC. Um, 
you know, you, you see these wide QRSs, you don't see any P waves, or if you do, they're kind of buried in the, in the bottoms of the T, the, the bottoms of QRSs there. Um, but this is basically VTAC. One way to know if somebody really has VTAC or not is to look at the V leads, V1 through V6, and see if you see any RS complexes in there. V3 looks a little bit suspicious, but the rest of them, there's absolutely no R and no S. So this is totally VTAC. What do you do if they're talking to you? You can get procainamide, but but I just use amiodarone. Um, the guidelines now say procainamide, but amiodarone is a phenomenal drug for this. And if they're unstable and they need to be shocked or defibrillated, fine. Um, if they're unstable, you give them 300 of amiodarone, and that should solve your problem. Uh, the next TKG here is your basic ST elevation MI. If you look at lead uh, 2 and 3, you see elevations. Um, you look at V2 and V1, you see depressions. Remember, nothing reciprocates there. Ischemia does not localize. Those are not reciprocal changes. That's a posterior MI because you have a, RV, you have a RCA infarct, and that feeds the posterior wall as well. AVL is depressed. Inferior leads always uh, reciprocate to AVL in 1. If you look at 1, it is also um, down. Um, it is an RV infarct as, as well because if you look at the, uh, the ST elevation in 3, is higher than the ST elevation in 2. And we know that that's very sensitive um, and very specific for an RV infarct. So this person is probably bradycardic, which if you look at this, they actually are. Everything is slow. They're hypotensive. Very sensitive to nitroglycerin. Make sure you get all the nitroglycerin off of them if it was put on as a paste. Don't give them anything that would drop their pressure or heart rate even more. They're already having problems with it because the AV nodal branch and the SA node are all supplied by the R R RCA. Next EKG uh, shows a, a pretty similar pattern, uh, even more bradycardic. Um, you see the uh, P waves are actually way out there, and they're almost in, in uh, third degree heart block, actually. So this person having an ST elevation MI of the inferior uh, region that's actually giving them pretty much complete heart block. And that's the, the, that's the problem with these uh, right-sided heart attacks. They also have a posterior MI. It's also involving the RV. Uh, because you see the ST elevation as well as the T wave in 3 are higher than uh, 2. So this is just an example of what can happen uh, with those. The next EKG here shows some PVCs. I don't see really anything more exciting than that. That one PVC, if you look at V2, you see the normal blip there. And the next one that looks like a PVC looks actually like a paste rhythm. Uh, this patient looks like they have underlying AFib. Um, and then if their heart doesn't beat fast enough, they get a paste beat, uh, which is what happened there um, if you look at the rhythm strip. But not, nothing really a whole lot more exciting than that. Low voltage kind of all throughout. Low voltage criteria in the, in the V leads is under 10 millimeters, the entire amplitude, positive and negative. Um, and then in the limb leads, like if you look at two, anything under five is considered low voltage, and this guy meets that criteria, but lead one is over five, so it doesn't. Um, but in the anterior chest leads, it does meet the criteria. None of those complexes are over 10, 10 millimeters in amplitude. The next one here, you see an ST elevation in V2 that the shape is actually wrong. Uh, but then you look down at V3 and the shape is actually correct. V4 also looks uh, suspicious. Um, if you're not really sure, just keep getting EKGs. Just plaster the wall with EKG paper. There's no reason... There's no reason why you should be guessing. Just get a troponin and keep getting EKGs and it'll reveal uh, itself. So don't worry. Next EKG, so is V2 elevated, V3 elevated, V4 elevated. No R wave whatsoever uh, in V4. Remember we said 13 millimeters uh, and below it considers is considered an acute MI. If you look at the QT corrected interval, probably under 392. Um, no reciprocal changes. You don't see any inferior... Uh, depressions, which is where these would normally uh, reciprocate to, but that doesn't mean anything. A lot of times that tells you that it's not that acute, um, but you can still have it. It could be persistent ST elevations. Um, people remember we said it, you can have up to three millimeters. Um, these ones look a lot higher than that, especially in V4, um, but either way, we need to uh, keep checking EKGs. If you look at V3, it almost looks like th that was a hyperacute T wave. Um, that wide, broad, symmetrical T wave, a hyperacute T wave that started now becoming an ST elevation. So this could be early on, and we just caught it before all the reciprocal changes and everything else happened. Next EKG here shows uh, ST elevations V4, V5, V2, V3, but they're all the wrong shape. If you look at leads 2, 3, AVF, they're all ST elevated. Um, 
if you look at lead two, that little blip after the QRS, uh, we call it an epsilon wave, um, that little blip there right away at the J point or right at the QRS where it meets the ST segment is got that little blip. This is benign early repolarization. Um, it's not anything uh, exciting at all. Um, the next EKG here really doesn't show anything too exciting. You've got uh, QRSs with P waves. You've got these STS. You've got these T wave inversions. If you look at V5, V6, um, lead two, um, these are inverted T waves. But these are not the ones we worry about. You know, these are ones that are eh. They're kind of inverted. They're, they're not all that abnormal. The ones we worry about are these big, deep inverted T waves, which I'm sure we'll see examples of. Next EKG here is very low voltage. You see in the limb leads, uh, less than 5 millimeters of amplitude. If you look at the chest leads, less than 10. Definitely meets the criteria for low voltage in the limb leads and the anterior chest leads. Now, this, this might, why, do, why is this an emergency EKG? The patient comes in, you look at their old EKG, and they got beautiful uh, QRS complexes that are tall and, and, and you know, above the, the isoelectric line and below the isoelectric line. They got muffled heart sounds. And you're trying to figure out what happened. You know, yesterday they were feeling fine. Today they come in feeling kind of short of breath, looking pale, you know, getting pitting edema in their legs. What's going on here? Well, you look at this and you got low voltage. What causes low voltage? Fluid around the heart or air around the heart. They could have a pneumopericardium. They could have real bad COPD. They could have a pneumothorax. Um, they could have tamponade with a hemopericardium or bl blood or fluid around the heart. Those are things that do that. Obesity, contrary to public opinion, does not do that. You have to have air and or water uh, around the heart to give you this. Uh, the next EKG here. Here you've got uh, ST depressions in V4, V3, uh, lead 3, lead AVF. you got an elevation in AVL and 1. Um, so this is a lateral uh, MI it looks like. You've got ST elevations. Um, your lateral leads do reciprocate to the inferior leads. Remember we said anterior uh, reciprocates to inferior and so does lateral. So your lateral, you're probably having a lateral uh, MI here with some posterior uh, involvement. You see V3 depressed as well. Some kind of septal uh, posterior uh, involvement. Now the OMs and the circumflex uh, artery can uh, sometimes feed parts of the inferior wall um, with collaterals, and that's definitely uh, a possibility going on here. Next EKG shows some inverted T waves in V2, uh, almost like that Wellens looking uh, shape. Um, you want to count the QT corrected interval, you know, to, uh, to see if it's under 425 or not. But for Wellens criteria, it usually is wider uh, than that. So. That's, that may or may not be anything there. Just check a troponin, keep getting uh, EKGs. It will reveal itself. But this is probably the closest ex example we have of a Wellens. You see the T wave in V3 um, is inverted. There's that like 60 degree drop um, from that funny shaped part of the ST segment. And then it goes down like that on that kind of an angle. Next EKG, you got lead three um, depressed, AVF depressed. You got AVL elevated, one elevated V2, 3 elevated. Those almost look like hyperacute T waves there in V3. They're a little bit asymmetrical, but looks like uh, it finally started elevating. This is looks like your basic lateral MI um, with the proper inferior uh, reciprocal changes. Next here, we got a bradycardic rhythm. Um, you got ST elevations in lead 3, 2, AVF with the proper reciprocation to AVL. Um, ST elevation in 3 is higher than 2, which puts you at an RV infarct. You also got a posterior MI because you got V2 depressed, V3 depressed. So this is your basic inferior, posterior, uh, and maybe even lateral because uh, you got V6 elevated, lateral uh, acute MI. Next EKG, you got ST elevations in lead 3, only almost. Well, it's kind of subtle. Um, but here you have an ST depression in AVL. The, the AVL segment is ST depressed. Remember I told you ischemia does not localize. You can't just say the patient has lateral ischemia. That, that doesn't happen. There's no such thing. If you have ischemia, V5 will be depressed and lead 2 will be, will be depressed, not just AVL. So if AVL is depressed, you got to think this is probably a reciprocal change for an actual STEMI somewhere. So where's the STEMI? What reciprocates to AVL? It's the inferior leads. Look at the inferior leads. AVL... Uh, look, uh, 3 is somewhat elevated, and AVF 
not if you got to measure it closely, but it looks a little elevated. So this is probably an evolving inferior MI. You actually already have a Q wave there. It's not a significant one on lead three, but it's there. If you listen to the basic EKG lecture, you'll find out what are um, significant or non-significant Q waves. So AVL there um, is a tip-off. It's not ischemia. It's a reciprocal change to the inferior MI. Be careful about that. Next EKG, what do you see here? Um, you do see QRSs. They're wide. If you look at V4, the S wave is kind of pulled out. You know, you got a sharp R that goes down, then the S wave is tugged out. Um, the T wave is kind of blunted and pushed down. You almost don't even see the P waves. This is hyperkalemia, uh, moderate to high, uh, more moderate really. This is like in the range of six and a half to seven and a half. Um, it's an EKG diagnosis. You don't even really need to do anything else. You start giving them insulin, um, the blood, and, and get a get a BMP to find out what their potassium is. It's an EKG diagnosis. Nothing else will give you this pattern. Next here, you also have some ST elevations. You look at V4. It's got that little epsilon notch. Same with V5. You look at lead 2, you can kind of notice it. Lead 3 as well. Um, so this is your basic uh, benign early repolarization uh, with nothing really exciting going on there. Next EKG, deep inverted T waves in V2 and V3. These are the significant deep inverted T waves we've been talking about. This could be an anterior MI. This could be real bad COPD. This could be a PE. Um, this could be anything. These are the real deal, not like the ones in V5. You see those ones in V5 and V4? That's not what we're worried about. We're worried about that one in V2 and V3. Next EKG, you've got ST elevations, 2, 3, AVF, depressions in AVL, V2, V1, you got an elevation in V4, V5, V6. Wow, this person has a ginormous RCA. This is what we call a mega dominant RCA. The RCA um, feeds the posterior wall, the lateral wall, some parts of the anterior wall. Um, this person may have a chronically occluded LAD even, and that, and that's why why they're getting uh, blood flow from the RCA. If you have a chronic total occlusion of your LAD, uh, blood will flow acro across collaterals to your LAD. And if you infarct your RCA, this is what's going to happen. Mega dominant RCA, uh, bad situation to be in. I'm not sure if this guy lived or not. Next tier, you see anterior elevations, pretty straightforward. V2 through V4, all elevated. QT uh, corrected interval is greater than 392. The R wave in V4 is depressed. Um, this is an acute MI, anterior MI. Um, you don't see reciprocal changes in the inferior leads, but you don't have to. Next, this is what? A little bit wide, looks like a left bundle branch block, a little bit fast. V5 almost looks like VTAC. Um, the question in these wide and fast ones is, is it VTAC or is it an SVT with aberrancy? Here it looks way too irregular. If you look at V3, first two are kind of close together. Uh, then you got two more narrow ones together, then a wider one. This is AFib um, with RVR and a left bundle branch block. That's all it is. That's what SVT with aberrancy means. Next one here, low voltage all throughout. The QRSs are depressed. The T waves are down. You don't see any P waves. The S segment of the QRS is pulled out and stretched. This is your basic uh, hyperkalemia uh, EKG uh, as well. Um, remember, this is an EKG diagnosis. You don't need to do anything fancy to diagnose this. Next, you got massive ST elevations in lead three, AVF, lead two a little bit. You got depressions in AVL, one, V6, V5. Um, this is your basic acute MI as well of the inferior uh, segment. You do have an RV infarct as well, so the treatment protocol is lots and lots of fluids. Don't give them anything to make them hypotensive or bradycardic. Um, and, and that's basically uh, what you got to do. Next, you got ST elevations in V2, V3. They're not the right shape, uh, but they're getting there. Um, you got, uh, what else do you have? No real other changes. It's a good example of, of what they look like when they're not the right shape. The Q wave in V2 and V3, the Q wave in V2 and V3 is wider than a small box, so it is significant and abnormal. Um, you got V1 that's elevated. This could be an evolving anterior uh, MI, keep an eye on the patient, keep checking uh, EKGs and, and just see what happens. Next EKG here, look at V3, V2, immediately you can tell something's not right. V4, um, these almost look like those Wellens uh, uh, shape, but this is an acute MI, the anterior uh, MI, no R wave in V4 whatsoever. 
Um, you got these L STL vagines of the proper shape. There's no reciprocal changes, um, but you don't really have to have them. Um, this is an acute anterior MI. Next, you got a funny fast rhythm, a uh, little bit wide. You look at V2, you got a left bundle branch pattern there. Same with V1. Um, could be a fib with aberrancy. Uh, could be VTAC. The one thing that gives it away that it's not VTAC, if you look at V4 and V3, there's a clear R wave and a clear S wave. Anytime you have an RS complex in your anterior chest leads, argues highly against VTAC. So this is definitely not VTAC. It's way too irregular anyways. Um, VTAC is very, very, very regular. It doesn't have to be, but it usually is. Next, if you look at V3 and V2, you almost have that hyperacute T wave pattern once again. Very symmetrical T wave starting to elevate. Look at V4 elevated. Look at the R wave in V4 is not over 13 millimeters. You look at the inferior leads, the 3 and AVF, they're depressed. You look at AVL being elevated, 1 being elevated. In this case, you probably have an anterior lateral MI. And when you have an anterior lateral MI, that's the circumflex and the LAD, you probably have a left main stenosis. You have a thrombus sitting in the left main uh, above uh, both those branches. Um, this could be very, very dangerous. This, this person needs prompt attention uh, right away. Next here, you have an EKG AVL somewhat depressed. So in this case, if you saw AVF, uh, I'm sorry, if you saw AVL, somewhat depressed like that. Remember I said you got to look for the reciprocal, assume it's a reciprocal change and look for the anterior eleva uh, the elevation. The elevation for AVL would be inferior. And if you look closely now, you can kind of see it. Three and AVF are elevated. It's a subtle inferior MI uh, treated as such. Next one, you got these wide QRSs, very, very wide, very bradycardic. Three beats in 10 seconds is, is uh, not very good. Uh, the machine read it as 60 beats. Uh, per minute because it counted the QRS and the T wave as two different beats. It just didn't know, so the machines are not that smart. That's why a, a doctor has to look at all EKGs. So, what is this? This is your basic hyperkalemia. Now, this is the extreme form of hyperkalemia. This is over 7.5 and, and, and it's probably over 10. This is the EKG where you look at the people around you and you say, Why the hell are you doing an EKG? Why aren't we doing chest compressions or something on this guy? But I'm glad they did it because, you know, I got the EKG and I'm able to produce it here for you guys. This is almost that sine wave pattern um, that everybody talks about. But this is a very uh, dangerous EKG. You should be putting in the dialysis catheter, giving him loads and loads of insulin right away. Next EKG here, um, you've got a couple PVCs, uh, but you got lead three, looks okay. You got a lead two depression, and it's the right shape. Whenever you got a depression in lead two, you got to assume it's a posterior MI. It's not a reciprocal change for anything. If you look at AVL, actually, AVL is depressed as well. You can't have AVL ischemia. You can't have lateral ischemia. Go back and look at lead two and three, and they, in fact, are elevated. Um, the PVC throws it off since you only have one beat to look at. Um, but when you look at AVF, it's elevated. Uh, both the beats in AVF are elevated. In, in lead three, you can't tell because there's just a one beat, but even that one beat has a pretty wide Q wave as well as the elevation. So this is your basic inferior posterior MI, um, RV involvement, uh, RV infarct, uh, treated as such. Next EKG here, ST elevations in three, two, AVF, depressions in AVL. Um, the rhythm looks somewhat uh, irregular. Um, almost like an AFib uh, with this. So you have an inferior po inferior MI with RV infarct and an irregular rhythm that uh, to me looks uh, like AFib or at least some of the beats uh, look like that. Maybe it's got some underlying um, ectopy or something. But this is definitely uh, an inferior RV infarct. Once again, look at V4, V2, V3. Right away, enter MI screaming right at you. QT corrected interval over 392. R wave in V4 is non-existent. Um, no reciprocal changes, and it is what it is. You, you can immediately treat this and get them going to a cath lab. Next here, you look at 3, which has got a depression. That's the one thing that stand, stands out right away. You look at V3 and V2, nothing nothing that exciting there. V1 looks okay as well. 
Um, but the one thing that kind of stands out the most is that depression in V2. And remember, we said ischemia does not localize. If you look at AVF, there's a depression as well. Um, so we said depressions, you can't just ignore them. Um, depressions in AVF and, and lead 2 would make you think there's an inferior ischemia, but we said if ischemia doesn't localize, you got to look for the anterior or lateral elevation. So you look at AVL, you look at 1, you look at V6, nothing that exciting. Look again at the anterior leads, nothing that exciting. Keep getting EKGs on this person. Maybe something will reveal itself. If you look at AVR, um, you have an ST elevation in AVR. Um, sometimes that tips you off to triple vessel disease. Uh, but but it hasn't been proven uh, over time. Next here we got a wide, not really fast rhythm, but a wide rhythm. Looks a lot like VTAC, if you, especially if you look at lead one uh, and lead four. But it's so irregular um, that it, that you 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 definitely shouldn't be thinking VTAC at all. This is AFib with a left bundle branch block. Um, look for an RS complex in the V leads, and you definitely see V2, V3, V4. They all have a little blip going of an R and then an S, and this is clearly AFib with RVR. Next EKG here, it's very, very subtle, but you see there's an ST elevation in lead 2, you see one in AVF. If you look at AVL, where they would normally reciprocate to, the ST segment doesn't look right. Um, something's not right with this one. You could argue for early repo in V4 and V5, uh, based on that little epsilon blip there, as well as V6. Um, I don't know, just keep checking EKGs on this one and see if it reveals itself. But at this point in time, it doesn't look like anything exciting. Next EKG, um, you look at lead 2, and it's got a very funny looking uh, uh, ST segment that kind of slopes down into an inverted T wave. And you see that kind of in V3 as well and V4. This is LVH. Um, don't get excited about these depressions. This is just LVH. This is what, you know, these are the non. Um, these are the ST segment changes of LVH, and this is exactly what you're seeing here. Next uh, EKG, um, what are we looking at here? You got lead 2 and 3 with some ST depressions, or very funny looking ST segments. Same with AVF. You look at AVL, where they would normally reciprocate to, doesn't look too exciting. Um, V2 and V3, you've got these tall, symmetric, wide. Uh, T waves, these are probably your hyperacute T waves. The ST segments for the anterior MI are already starting to change by looking at 2, 3, and AVF. This is an acute anterior MI, hyperacute waves. His wife is still telling him, please get to the hospital, let's go to the hospital, and he's still saying no, no, no. Um, so that's why they're hyperacute, because they're more acute than acute. Uh, next EKG, if you look here, you got one, two, three P waves uh, in between uh, QRSs. Um, or at least two. Um, if you look at the PR interval, um, it is never the same. There, no, no two PR intervals are the same. Um, it's very hard because you don't get a clean P wave in, in any of these uh, leads, um, in the rhythm leads. Probably third degree uh, AV block. So in third degree AV block and complete heart block, when do you need to put in a temporary pacemaker? Now this guy's heart rate is not that slow. Just looking at it off the top of my head, He's got one, two, three, four, five, six beats, almost a seventh one on there. Six beats in 10 seconds is almost 60. Uh, so you don't have to worry about it. The time you have to worry about it is if they get so bradycardic that they start getting confused or losing consciousness. Usually that happens in rates um, under 30, 28, 26, definitely. Um, but a lot of people, athletes and, 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 and people who are well conditioned, they can have heart rates in the 35 to 45 range um, when they're sleeping without any issues. So don't don't get too excited unless they're you know starting to reveal uh, something to you um, with their level of consciousness. And you could always call us too if you think a guy needs a pacemaker or temporary and you don't want to do it or if you've never done it, just give us a call. Next EKG here, you look at lead three. Uh, there's a PVC to, to start it out, but the second one is elevated. Look at AVF, elevated, AVL, depressed. Uh, look around some more, too many PVCs, can't really tell much else. V2 and V3, when you do see the beats properly, uh, they look like they're depressed as well. Inferior MI with RV involvement and a posterior MI as well. Um, treat them properly for an inferior posterior MI with the RV infarct. Next one, it's fast and narrow. What do you do with fast and narrow? If you look at that rhythm strip at the bottom, you can actually see the P waves exactly right after every QRS, right at the S there at the bottom. Um, so when you, this is called a short RP um, tachycardia. 
um, might not mean really much to, to folks that are working in the ER. Um, to us, it does, and we know how to ablate it and to get rid of it. But what is this? You can give them adenosine, and if it slows down and looks really irregular, then it's AFib. If you give them adenosine, they convert to normal sinus rhythm, then, it's, then it was uh, SVT or AVNRT. Um, so that's really the approach you should take to these. Do not shock these people or, or do anything crazy. Adenosine, and if it looks like AFib or sinus tack or something else, you can put them on beta blockers or, or dil diltiazem. Next one here, you've got ST elevations V4, V5, um, V3 looks unusual. If you look at lead one, the S wave is down. It's a pretty big S wave. If you look at lead three, the S wave is down. You got an inverted T wave in lead three. I think they're trying to get us at the S1, Q3, T3. Um, you got V1 that's elevated. When V1 is elevated, that tells you have RVH because V1 is a is a right sided lead. Um, so is three, but you've got RVH here, um, which is a right-sided or pulmonary um, strain pattern. You got an S that's depressed, uh, a, a Q wave, and a T that's inverted in three. Um, that usually we call that S1, Q3, T3, and we say it's a RV strain pattern or pulmonary uh, injury pattern or pulmonary strain pattern. Usually we say it has to go with PE. The top five findings on an EKG in somebody with a PE are sinus tachycardia, sinus tachycardia, sinus tachycardia, sinus tachycardia, five of times. Um, you rarely ever see this pattern, uh, especially in an acute PE. Next EKG, you've got a funny looking pattern in V2 with the ST segment depressing to into that inverted T, sort of looks like that Wellens criteria. Um, V4, you have a R wave, but it's not very tall. Uh, this could be an anterior uh, MI. You should probably treat it as such. Keep getting EKGs and check troponins. This is sort of showing what a uh, Wellens criteria looks like. Uh, next EKG here, you definitely got a right bundle branch block. If you look at V1, uh, V2, they're all upright. Really don't have much else going on here. All the other leads kind of look okay. Um, wouldn't get too excited about anything else. Basically just a right bundle branch block. Next EKG here. Um, if you look at this uh, a little bit on the bradycardic side, V2, V3, uh, V1 look a little bit uh, on the funnier side um, with the ST segments a little bit elevated. Leads 2, 3, and AVF look okay. AVL looks a little bit suspicious, uh, AVL there, but probably not anything uh, too exciting, just somebody to keep an eye on. Uh, next EKG here, you got V2 looks awfully unusual, V3 looks unusual. Um, this is a good example, probably what uh, Wellens criteria uh, looks like. Keep checking EKGs, get a troponin, try to find out what this patient has. The R wave in V4 being so tall argues highly against anything acute going on uh, in the uh, anterior leads. So just keep an eye on this one. Next EKG is pretty obvious. You immediately see those ST depressions and inversions in the inferior leads, um, which leads you to think that maybe there's something going on. Uh, somewhere else, but then you look and then you see it in V5, V4, lead 2. Uh, this is uh, one of those cases where um, you see ischemia and it's and it's all throughout. Um, when you see ischemia, lead 2 and V5 are going to be your most sensitive and that's um, what this person has. Next one, if you look at this very closely, it's kind of a subtle finding. Look at lead 3. You see that first QRS there, how it falls on that first line. Look how far out that T wave goes. Um, you got that Q there and then you go all the way out to where that T is. It's it's very, very far. A QT interval for men under 440 is normal and for women under 460 is normal. This is like almost 600. This is very prolonged QT uh, prolongation. There's a few conditions um, that can do that. Hypocalcemia can do that. Um, hypothermia um, there's just a few things, and sometimes people have congenital uh, prolonged QT, and these are things you want to watch out for. This, if somebody gets too tachycardic um, or something happens, they can easily deteriorate and go into V-fib or torsades or some other horrible rhythm. Next EKG, look at V1. That is an uh, artifact. That is not V-fib, so don't get confused because there's a little bit of action going on in just one lead. Uh, don't go ahead and try to defibrillate the guy or anything. Next one. You got ST elevations 2, 3, AVF, correctly uh, reciprocating to AVL in 1. V2 is depressed, V3 is depressed. Um, this is pretty much your basic 
uh, acute MI, uh, I'm sorry, acute inferior MI, posterior MI uh, with the RV infarct. The ST segments in 3 and 2 look about the same, but the T wave in 3 is higher. So if you can't see the ST segments or there's no difference in the ST segments, you can look at the top of the, P, uh, the T wave. So the top of the mountain in, in lead 3 is higher than 2, which gives you the RV infarct as well. Next number, this is a famous board question. This throws everybody off. Immediately when you look at this, you think torsades or VTAC or VFib or something crazy like that. But that's not it. I'll give you a second to try to figure out what you think it is. It's not what you think. Look very, very closely at a lead like lead V5 uh, or V4. You see, first of all, it's very irregular. The beats are not one after another. There's spaces. If you look at under V4 and above V5, there's gaps um, and they're irregular. So this is probably a fib. What's making it look really, really wide like that is because they have a delta wave. This is WPW. They have an accessory pathway with VFib. Now this is not a cardiac emergency now, but they're pretty fast. If you want to slow them down, you got to be very, very, very careful with what you slow them down with. When you have an accessory pathway uh, somewhere out in your left lateral wall uh, of the left ventricle, let's say you give them esmolol or adenosine or any AV nodal blocking agent, cardizem, you block their AV node, that pathway is so fast, as you can tell from here, and it's capable of conducting at 300 beats per minute or more. Um, this pa patient can easily get that, go 300 beats per minute, decompensate, have hemodynamic collapse, go into V-fib or, or, or something else, um, and, and, and go into real torsades. And then this patient needs to be coded in ACLS protocol. So when you ever have WPW and AFib, you want to... Uh, convert them to normal sinus rhythm or you want to slow them down. Let's say you don't even want to convert them. You just want to slow them down. One of the best ways to block accessory pathways is procainamide. Do not block the AV nodal branch until you block the accessory uh, pathway. So make sure uh, you do that. Um, you can use procainamide as well as amiodarone, but your board exams are going to be uh, expecting you to uh, say procainamide is the correct answer. So that concludes emergency EKGs. I hope you learned a lot. If you did, subscribe to my channel and tell all your friends about it.